Good morning and welcome to the Stalls TV Morning Show. I'm Zach. And I'm his brother, Josh. <laughs> that's true. That's great. Hey, we were just having a conversation before the show went live about how we both need haircuts. Hopefully the viewers don't notice it. We kind of just pointed it out. But where would you go to get your haircut? Where would I go to get my haircut? Yeah. Actually, I, I bounce around to a lot of different places. I don't shop on price. I shop on convenience. Uh, typically, whatever's open. So whatever you have no ready. loyalty when it comes to getting your haircut? No, I guess I don't. Okay. Pretty don't easy either. cut, though. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. I would really just prefer it if, you know, when we were kids, mom used to cut our hair. It was bad. Yeah. I mean, not, <laughs> not the haircut. I'm just <laughs> sorry. Anyways. Yeah, it was. Let's move on before you get me in trouble. All right. Sorry. So we have a great show for you today. Normally, when we do a how-to show, we're going to be over at the heat press showing you how to press a certain garment or an apparel trend or create a certain look that you see in retail. Today's going to be a little bit different. It is a how-to show, but it's how to build a fundraising campaign for your decorating business. Not to raise funds for your decorating business, but for other people. And I think it's going to be uh, a pretty exciting episode. Yeah, we have a lot of visual um, examples, uh, a lot of best tips and practices mm -hmm. that we want to share with you um, throughout the day, um, throughout this morning's show. But before we get to that, um, we like to share a little bit of news around the industry and really around decorated apparel period. Mm -hmm. um, and something big that's really been happening since the first of the year is Amazon getting into offering uh, decorated apparel to sellers and stores in their marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. It's called the Amazon Merch Program. They launched it uh, close to the end of last year, and they have had such a huge response to it that it has moved to an invitation-only program. So basically, if you're a seller on Amazon of anything, they, they focused originally on digital content creation. So folks who were developing video games or things of that nature is what they started to focus on. You can create a t-shirt design mm -hmm. from your brand, your brand identity, or a character within the video game and make it available for sale online. And Basically, you just upload your artwork, Amazon takes it, and they print the shirts that are ordered through Amazon.com. Now, the printing methods that they're using, they're actually using two different methods and then a hybrid method in between. They partnered, they made a press release, they partnered with Cornet, which most of our viewers are probably familiar with, a Cornet direct-to-garment machine. Some of the most expensive out there in the industry because of their capacity and throughput. Um, but orders under 50 pieces are being direct-to-garment printed. In that 50 to 250 piece range, it's a hybrid between a screen print base and Cornet colors on top, and then 250 plus Amazon's just screen printing. Yeah, it's a pretty unique concept, but one that plays well in today's topic because they're really, they're making a profit, but they're really allowing the seller or the store mm -hmm. to make uh, some profitability as well by being able to share and have people buy into their brand. Um, I think it's Custom Inc's uh, tagline actually, T-shirts unite, whether that's around a cause, a brand, um, a school, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think that's interesting. I think as an apparel decorator, you can, you can be worried that you know, Amazon is taking over uh, mm -hmm. the world, or you could take the concept and say there's a certain portion of business that's done on Amazon or online period, and then I can take those same concepts and perhaps apply them in my local community and go out to uh, video game shops or things of that nature mm -hmm. and start to uh, sell the concepts in that way, allowing them to make profit while I print locally. Right. You like how I fired back at you. I do. That was great. <laughs> so one of the uh, things that I found most interesting and maybe helpful um, to our decorators that, that watch or tune into the Stalls TV morning show is in the FAQ, they were giving some tips on how to sell more shirts. So they said the number one thing that people invest in is a brand that they identify with or that they're passionate about. So if you have a t-shirt with a particular brand or if you have a particular brand, no one in your area, find, make t-shirts that associate people with that. The second thing was funny sayings. Funny, funny sayings. sayings sell t-shirts, according to Amazon. Like good meowing. Yes, good meowing. Welcome to the Pause TV Morning Show. Yeah, but last week was the pet episode. Hopefully yes. you guys joined uh, Courtney and Courtney and Karen and the puppies for the uh, morning show last week. If not, it's always recorded. But I think it's interesting that people want to affiliate with a certain brand or even a style of garment. And for that reason, it's very important to uh, stay on top of mm. blank apparel and what's available out that and what's available out there and perhaps even start to build up some brand recognition in the styles of apparel. I mean, you can source Nike garments from uh, Sanmar. There's a lot of different sort of uh, retail brands that are available through your wholesale supplier. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so I let's try jump. To avoid saying it. Okay, let's jump into the fundraising aspect. So we have a great audience today. I appreciate everybody jo joining live on the Stalls TV Morning Show. As mm -hmm. always, if there's questions as we're going through the presentation, this is one of those sessions where um, ask them. We'll stop several points throughout. We'll have Joe uh, chime in with your viewer questions, and we'll answer those on air. Um, so when we talk about fundraising, I guess let's define um, what a fundraising component of the business is first. Okay. Are you going to do that for us? I'm going to do that for okay. you. So fundraising basically is a way for you to set up to appeal differently to a group, whether that's a school group, um, a dance school, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. It's to set up to allow them profit potential from what you're decorating. So there's two people making profit on a fundraising sale. There is the actual um, school or organization that you're selling to, and mm -hmm. then of course you as the business owner making profit. So you need to make sure you establish margins that are going to allow profitability for both and a strategy, and we'll go through that. Okay. From your experience in doing the research on fundraising and kind of being involved with it with your daughter's activities, which groups um, give you the most profit potential, in your opinion? It, it depends. Um, to me, I think dance schools and cheer, certainly. Uh, they spend a lot of money, even travel ball teams, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of sort of people that will spend more money on uniforms are also going to spend more money on the auxiliary stuff like spirit wear or fan gear. Um, so I think those are nice markets to cover. But I think, you know, profit potential, I think, is really dictated by not necessarily the, the defined market, but the strategy, the offer, what you create. Because you can drive more profit by staying on trend and different in your design work. So there's not as many competitors. So I think that's as, as important as the actual market itself. Yeah. When we talk about fundraising, I my mind immediately goes to selling candy or selling some type of lottery ticket or something like that to raise funds. Do you see that as direct competition to apparel fundraising or is it more complementary? Um, I, th I think it can be direct competition, but I find that many places that do the cookie dough or the candy sales, mm -hmm. They're going to have school spirit apparel anyways, like when you're talking about schools or a dance school. Mm. And so they're able to plug this in in addition to. So if they have a specific two fundraisers we do a year, often apparel can sort of break the rules in that and be a complementary to your point um, to where they want to increase the brand recognition. And instead of just selling school apparel um, to unite the school in awareness, they're doing it to make a little bit of profit margin as well. Okay, so I know if it is in direct competition, one of the most important sales tools that you have as a decorator is showing them how they can make more money selling apparel than they can candy bars or whatever that other fundraiser is. So I think you have some stuff put together that'll show us how to outline that. Yeah, yeah, and before before I go too deep in it, something to, to consider is the, you know, the candy bar, they may advertise, you know, 80% margin <clears throat> or 70% margin, mm -hmm. but the reality is you need to think about the actual dollars and present the actual dollars in profit. So why the percentage of margin on a hooded sweatshirt or a t-shirt may be less margin points than a candy bar, mm -hmm. it's going to be more margin dollars for everybody that's buying. So 100% of zero is still zero. That's a fact. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's start with some potential markets. Um, we've we've sort of created an outline of some opportunities here. We've mentioned schools so far. Mm -hmm. We've mentioned uh, dance schools. Um, I have churches as another potential mm -hmm. uh, fundraising opportunity. Um, something that's really been big lately is uh, in forever, but really in decorated apparel is causes. So whether that's um, an individual trying to raise fund for a particular cause, um, I think you have something. Uh, locally that we were talking about, uh, when was it, last week, where we had a, uh, a local company, everybody sort of rallying around a lung transplant yep. that mm -hmm. had to happen. So people donating percentage of profit for that. But launching a t-shirt sale um, for a cause like that is a great opportunity not only to raise money for that cause, but allow some profit and an opportunity for your business. Certainly. So number one is once you define the target market, which is important to the whole process, uh, we have the first component of creating an actual fundraising offer as establish the profit opportunity for sellers. So one of the ways, if we can switch to the uh, screen here, that you can outline this is uh, come up with your rules and try to draft a letter for your particular market. One particular thing that I like uh, with fundraising um, is creating benchmarks. So ultimately, there's going to be a certain amount of work that goes into creating this overall campaign, um, creating the artwork, the presentation tools, the samples that are going to go along with it. So 
if the fundraiser is not successful, if the school only sells $100 in apparel mm -hmm. off of all of your work, basically there's not a whole lot of margin points there. So make sure that you set benchmarks for them to achieve their percentages of profit. And that also helps on the flip side in turning these folks who are uh, doing the fundraiser into salespeople. Whenever you have clear goals, it's easier to, to try and achieve them if they have something that they're working towards. Yeah, so you see a little bit on how a letter might work that outlines the offer. It's important to have written content, something that you can duplicate um, and plug different company names or groups in. But if you look down at sort of the bullet points, you see here, sell $999 or less for the whole fundraiser. You're collecting 15% of sales. And you can see it's stepping up at different benchmarks to allow more profit and ultimately allowing you to do a, a bulk order and decoration to really make the most in efficiency of your decoration process. Mm -hmm. So uh, number one, establish benchmarks. Perhaps you even want to say $500 or, or less, 0% mm -hmm. of sales. And then you also want to draft a letter that keeps it simple and makes sense, like this sample um, here. Another key component uh, to fundraisers often is rewards and prizes for those selling it. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on your market, if it's students selling it or, or dancers at a dance school, you may want to consider um, some prize opportunity. Make sense? Yes. Um, I don't see any questions coming in yet um, that I know of, but if there's questions, feel free to ask. So in step one in creating an offer is establishing the profit opportunity for the sellers. Yes. Um, step two um, that I have here is define a product selection. So when it comes to defining products, um, you can really go nuts uh, with your product selection. I always recommend if you can present products, that are from just a couple suppliers, it's going to help you a lot when you actually go to order and decorate them. Uh, you're gonna save on freight costs, it's gonna simplify your ordering process. We mm -hmm. give you these tips in, in previous episodes, but it's especially important when you're doing a time sale or a fundraising sale to be able to define products from a singular supplier if possible. Yeah, and that's from you as a decorator's perspective, even from the buyer's perspective, the more choices that are there, the more difficult it's gonna be for them to make a decision. You might think if we throw the whole catalog at them, well, maybe they'll order one of everything. Odds are that's not gonna happen. They're gonna have more difficulty closing the sale and deciding exactly what they want. The reason that I know, I had this experience yesterday. You did? I did, it was in uh, a different market, but I went into Sears and we're, we're searching for a washer and dryer. And we went in and there were so many options that we had no clue which one to buy. And it was like, well, this one's great. This one's great too, they're $50 difference. But this one over here is great too. And this one's great too. So we walked out without making a decision just because there was too much to choose from. Yeah, yeah, the perplexity of selection um, can, can really cause issues. And we've talked about that a, a lot. So simple, we always recommend good, better, best. Mm -hmm. So a few sound choices, especially when you get to the point of actually executing the sale. You can present a lot of choices, but you need to hone it into a few smart selections. So when you're doing this, um, you know, coach the organization into um, selecting maybe um, an apparel item uh, that's a t-shirt, maybe one that's a hoodie, uh, perhaps a unisex style, but one that's uh, more feminine or more masculine, just basically covering all the bases, especially when you talk about who's actually going to be buying the garments to support it. If, there's, if you're selling it uh, to students as a school apparel sale, you better make sure you have some youth and smaller sizes that are going to be able to capitalize on that. And I always like when the same style runs from youth all the way up to mm -hmm. the adult or the junior sizes, because then the group is unified in the styling and your design choices as well. Yeah, I think uh, we can talk a little bit more uh, about the design choices. Do you have some of that, that that we can show on the best way to design for fundraising? Yeah, so if you want to switch back to the presentation here, Joe. Um, you can see this is the same uh, presentation uh, that we were just in with the letter. This is a way that perhaps you would outline some selections, and I'll go through some best practices here. We've broke it into groups. Um, you can see uh, we're doing some auxiliary items instead of just apparel, but I want to jump to uh, the apparel side here. Um, this was presented to the particular PTO coordinator for them to lower down their selection. So you can see something that's very important to the presentation. You're getting a visual of the design. Um, in this case, it's for Bethel Park High School, uh, which is a local high school. You're seeing the design in a virtual sample onto the garment. You're clearly seeing the uh, selection of sizes that are available. And you're seeing the potential profit amount if they reach the 30% benchmark, mm -hmm. knowing that they can make $6.60 in profit on this garment. Mm -hmm. um, 
Just to go through some smart ways to do this, you see we're leveraging the same blank style with a different design on it. So we're going to hope that they choose one of these um, two styles and not you know, the same blank. Um, you can see we're going to leverage that same design. And this is something really important. A certain amount of time is going, going to go into uh, developing artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and once you create a piece of artwork, you want to make sure it can be sized down for a left chest or up for a larger design right. and leverage that art component. So in this case, we uh, vectorized the particular clip art that was available, and we're just adding different elements to the clip art um, that will allow us to leverage all of our art preparation across the design. So you can see on the next design, there's even a little personalization option, but we're leveraging the same clip art. Mm -hmm. From there, it's just text elements. Um, we're walking through in a unisex style depending on what they're liking. Once again, leveraging the same clip art on a pant style. And you start to get the point where leveraging that same thing clear across all the design components just with a little iteration or tweak to it mm -hmm. um, to make it easy enough where it's duplicatable, repeatable, and we've invested the time to create the art. Now we're going to maximize it and what we're showing. And ultimately, it helps them to maintain uh, their brand position as well. Yeah. And Obviously, when you're selling to schools, you're going to get into using the same colors over and over again. But when you get into dance schools and some of those other organizations that might not have a clear brand position, they might want to be all over the map and say, well, I want to offer these eight different colors of the dance school name. Well, we really want them to do one, probably two or three colors uh, to where, depending on our print process, we can gang up those designs and print them together. Yeah, absolutely. If you can, if you can organize colors, especially if you're operating with a vinyl cutter or a screen printed mm -hmm. transfer, it helps you. Um, to not have to order a bunch of different colors and materials or a bunch of different per color fee on your screen printed transfer type. Yeah. Um, so I think we're having some questions roll in. This is, we're going to go into uh, greater detail here in a moment, but let's stop for a couple questions. In doing a fundraiser like this, I'd like to know what is your favorite garment brand to bring into it? Uh, my, my personal favorite line is just, um, I'm very experienced with Sandmar, so it dep I guess it depends on your niche and the market you define. If you're looking for, for a good all-purpose supplier, Sandmar has a great selection. Um, I like to offer you know, a basic tee and then a uh, performance tee option. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also in love with their new uh, tri-blend collection. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel unbelievable and it's something that the end customer will actually talk about after they wear it and they'll be wanting to come back for more. Yeah. Can you discuss perceived value in relationship to fundraising and promotions? I think it's probably time to look at your spreadsheet for MSRP. Okay, yeah, so this is a, a good time to go into that. So let me pull that up here. Um, basically, you know, you went, we went through this presentation um, showing the different looks. If we switch over now to the Excel workbook, um, this has the combination of all these looks, and this is tough to digest at first glance. There's a lot of information there, so let's just look at one line and go through it. Um, here, the rows two and three, we're looking at a long sleeve zip up hoodie, the same style that's ranging from a girl's three up to a you know, girl's seven to 16 size in that style. Um, we're outlining the item cost, the design cost, all the components that go into it, including labor and overhead and we're really getting our cost to make. Mm -hmm. Now, I always recommend in your pricing strategy, don't do something like keystoning this and doubling the selling price. I've went through that uh, before. It can really leave you short or really leave you priced out of the market. You're just going to have to have good instincts of what something can sell for. And in doing surveys, a lot of people do have good instincts on what they can command from a market price. So we think in the zip-up hoodie style that you saw earlier in the presentation, we can command $30 out of it. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I'd set it, you know, I think there's a higher price because the school's selling it, knowing that the school is going to make some profitability on it, so I can think you can place it a little bit above where your direct price would be. Understanding that if this is a channel you want to reach, you don't want to go in and offer direct pricing after this. If somebody comes back and wants one more, you better make sure that you sell it at the price point and give some profit back to the school. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see we ran the calculation at a 30% discount saying if the school makes $9 on this, if they get to the 30% benchmark, which is, was, the, I think, the $4,000 sale or higher, we're going to sell it to them for $21, which is still going to allow me a profit per piece of $8 plus, uh, depending on the size. And so we, I run this equation across all the styles and say, hey, if they get to that 30% benchmark, am I going to be happy with the profitability on that piece? And as you can see here, just about everything on the list is $8 
per piece in profit or higher. So in general, I think we can say that there's going to be a higher price point that you can command, just like at an event, it's an impulse buy. Right. When it's a fundraiser, people understand that they are supporting um, whatever is raising the funds, whether that's a school, dance school, whatever it might be. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Let's uh, handle one more before we get back into it. Okay. So when planning a live fundraising event, how do you determine how much bulk apparel they should have on hand? Yeah, so printing on site um, and how much is a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, I really recommend if you can take your heat press there, that's awesome um, because you're not committing your inventory. So if you have a particular style that you're going to leverage across multiple sales, go for it. Um, this comes to smart color selection as well. You'll notice in the presentation I went through, you saw lots of white, black, and charcoal or ash. These are neutrals. So I can leverage these across future sales if I get stuck with an inventory, especially for on-site printing. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to coach you on specific quantities, it's going to depend on your audience, but know that you know your small, medium, largest are going to be the bulk of what you're going to do. And if you go with neutral colors, it's really going to give you that insurance policy that you can reuse the blanks that you don't decorate. Yeah, I think this also leads us into setting the rules for the fundraiser. That on-site type fundraising probably isn't going to end up being necessarily the most profitable or the most ideal because we have to put that type of planning and investment up front. Um, one of the recommendations that we'd like to give you is the way that most other fundraisers work when you're working with candy. There's an order period of two weeks to get your orders in and then after that you're going to receive the stuff around a particular holiday or whatever that uh, is tied to. You have a two to three week turnaround after that to deliver to where you can gang up all of your orders and deliver all together. Yeah, and so let me go to the last slide in that presentation, if we can jump back over here. I'm going to click through a bunch of them here. Um, you can see from about 20 to 30 items uh, presented, here was the actual selection. So from a best practices standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, we say try to get down to five to seven items um, that are actually running with the sale. You can always save more for next year or later that year. Um, so try to get down to a, a smaller selection. And then with setting the rules, uh, we find, as Zach mentioned, defining the period of time that the sale will go on is going to work best. It'll help you group the orders, group your decoration and plan. It'll also keep the buyers accountable to turn in their orders and it just helps organize a lot better. Um, and then part of setting the rules is defining how the orders will be taken. And I see two real choices here. If we had this style, um, we could do a uh, poster or a take-home brochure that could go home with the students mm -hmm. um, where they could fill it out and you could create you know, a basic order form, um, a spirit gear order form that would look something like this where they could fill out for family members or whoever they sell to and turn it back in at the school office or to the PTO. Or perhaps a simpler way that takes more of the hands-off approach for the office or the school is to just establish a custom web link. Mm -hmm. um, where if you have a website that's created such as on Shopify, you can create your website name, so Josh's T's backslash Bethel Park. Mm -hmm. And everybody can go to that unique URL if you set up the products on the website and buy during that period. Yeah, and it's, um, it's significantly less investment. It's a little bit more investment on the time side, but that's also a link that when they come back next year, all you have to do is change out the products that are there rather than ordering a bunch of apparel in and risking not using it. You can take the time on the upfront to set up that website, and it's good year after year after year. Yeah, and once you set up an item of blank apparel, um, in a site like Shopify on the back end, it's mm. typically as simple as duplicating it. Mm. And so if I'm selling to another school that doesn't have the same design, I can duplicate the listing with the sizes and description and simply change out the photo and build another um, custom URL to run mm. that sale. So uh, duplicatable, replicatable process. That's why it's important up front, define the niche that you want to work, um, whether it's schools or dance schools or whatever it is craft your offer, and then start to create these components such as presentation pieces, letters, profit potential, uh, website listings mm -hmm. that can be duplicated um, so you're not spending as much time up front in crafting the offer. Yeah, after you build it, it's just plug and play after that. Yeah. More One, questions? Yeah, let's go to questions while I read through my notes of what else I wanted to share here. One of the biggest questions that we're getting is, will all of this information be available for them to download? They want sl the slide presentation, they want your letters, they want your, your charts. Yes, we will make it available. Right, Courtney? Right. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. we'll make it available. Um, and I'd recommend you put your own flavor to it, um, but this will at least give you a start. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, something else that I wanted to uh, mention, just facilitating success. So I'll jump back to the presentation um, to show you this previous slide here. Um, we give this to the school, um, tips for a sparkling flash sale. Obviously, we're playing off the glitter uh, material. Mm -hmm. um, this will review some of the concepts and the ways you want to coach. So pick something for everyone. We mentioned that already. Move beyond just t-shirts. Basically, uh, maximizing each potential buyer so they can buy more than just a t-shirt. They can get an iPad case, a, a backpack, whatever it might be. Uh, show samples. Um, samples sell. So when they launch the sale, not only do you want to have the printed piece going home, but it would be nice to have some samples on display in the school, in the dance school, floating around. Even if it's one single item, you know, don't, don't think you have to go crazy. If you do one single item and run a sale, often that's the best way to do it because mm -hmm. it keeps it really simple for you and it generates a lot of profit. And then you can do another item next month or in a couple months. But make sure that there's physical samples in the hands. And one way to do this is by giving a discount off of uh, the sample order, 50%. You don't want to do them for free in case you don't generate the profit per sale, but discount it. Mm -hmm. um, another item is pair items together. So make sure you match for the customers or create the designs in a style that if they pick a, a capri pant in a t-shirt, they can create a matching set so a buyer can buy a matching set. And then lastly, encourage them to promote. So give them the tools and the resources to promote, whether that's a PDF that they can print into a poster to hang up or that they can print into take-home flyers or a URL that they can share out via email, Facebook, whatever it might be. Um, these are all things that are going to help uh, facilitate uh, success. All right, let's go back to Joe and see if we have any more questions repeating. Uh, they ask if you could just repeat, was it Shopify, the, the website you're talking about? Yes. yes. And uh, when you're talking about pre-printing, uh, are you talking about custom orders at all? Or you, know, you don't want to get stuck with a load of sizes that don't sell uh, when you're negotiating your profit? I'm not following that question. Give me that one again. Are you talking about pre-printing your items for the sale? No. No. Pre-print your samples that are going to be on display. Let them order the samples. And ideally, those would display during the sale period. So if your sale starts at, let's just say, I don't even know what month we're in, June 1st, and ends at June 15th, have the samples on display during that ordering period. But when, once June 15th hits, that's when you're actually going to start producing the orders that are either placed at the web link or via the online or the turned in forum because mm -hmm. we're going to order quantities and we're going to deliver all of the garments together, perhaps individually bagged to make it convenient for distribution, but distribute all of them together um, a couple weeks or whatever your turn time is after the last date of the sale ends because mm -hmm. you don't want to be ordering one at a time and printing them. You're going to kill yourself on freight and just management time. The presentation material that you've shown, is this for an initial meeting, getting your foot in the door, or is this for, you know, once you've got them interested in, and they're committing to you for the fundraising? So what I would recommend um, initial meeting is uh, perhaps just knowing your offer and drafting a more simplified letter. This is, you know, a 20, 25-page uh, slide deck. This is after they've expressed interest and said that they want to move forward with the fundraiser and just needs helps. Need helps. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah, well, whatever. Need help uh, as far as assembling the item. So usually, um, I've mentioned this before, sending perhaps one sample garment with their logo in, whether it's just a youth or a mini t-shirt, with a nicely formed letter that says, hey, here's how we do fundraising package. Here is the profit you can expect to make. Mm -hmm. um, some of those things are going to help the process. Yeah, you're really um, taking principles from uh, a book called The Lean Startup. You want to do what they call the minimum viable product. So you want to do the least amount that you can do to get it out there, uh, get it tested, and start making profit off of it immediately. So there's a lot. there would be a lot of time in making that slide deck for every potential customer. So you want to generate some interest first before you go there. Yeah, so letter, phone call, dropping off a sample, that's a way to get started. And then one final question is, how do you handle some of the legal pieces of this? Like, do you advertise that all your sales are final? They, you know, how do you handle returns or things along those lines? Yeah, for customized products, uh, whether you're doing it for a fundraiser or anything, I always recommend that it's a non-returnable 
uh, product unless there is, you know, a defect in the manufacturing mm -hmm. of it. Like if a letter starts to peel off because you misheat applied it or whatever, then mm -hmm. certainly um, to keep your brand, you would want to allow that to be returned. But other than that, if there's not a manufacturer defect, um, sales are final. Yeah, and if you're keeping at least some samples, if, you, if you're consistent in your apparel options across the board for all of the fundraisers that you're doing, you may be able to supply them with a small, medium, large to where they can try on and uh, worry about sizing you know, on the front end. And then that's a great way to sort of coach the sample selection, especially on higher end items. Like if you're going to do like a track jacket or something for a dance school that you're going to allow the dance owner to make profit on, you're probably going to want to um, include uh, size choices and include that as part of the cost of doing business. Uh, another option would be because you can really bury yourself in administrative work up front mm -hmm. for people that don't sell much because everybody loves the idea of you creating a bunch of looks from them but can they really sell is charging a certain setup fee that will be ultimately refunded back to them at the completion of reaching the first benchmark is right. a great way to go. Yep. All right we're strong at 30 minutes um, so hopefully you found value in today's morning show um, I'm not even really sure what we're talking about next week. Um, we could talk about pricing and bundling and do that little exercise we did earlier this morning. Yeah, pricing and bundling would be good. Well, I'm getting signs over here. Okay, but either way, we'll come up with something very creative and unique uh, to present, not next week on the morning show, because it'll be Memorial Day. Ah, there is no morning show. <laughs> That's why we don't know. Okay. Dude, week that was after. way off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So hopefully uh, you have a good, enjoyable uh, week and a nice long weekend. Enjoy, enjoy Memorial Day uh, with your friends and family. Uh, we certainly will. And as always, thanks for watching the Stalls TV Morning Show.